I'm Nicole Major. I'm a Bundjalung woman from Northern New South Wales and the AEU Federal Aboriginal Education Officer. I acknowledge that we are on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I thank them for welcoming us and accepting us onto their lands, no matter who we are or where we have come from. I want to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and acknowledge their culture and knowledge that they bring with them from their homelands. I want to acknowledge the non-Aboriginal people here today who walk with us on our journey to help to create a fair, smart, compassionate and prosperous country that we can all be proud of. The cultural diversity of this country is one of our greatest attributes. It is fundamental to our identity, and it's fundamental to our national identity. Some of us here today are lucky enough to be descended from the world's oldest continuous cultures, the first peoples of this land. We have a connection to this land that goes back tens of thousands of years. Others of you here today are lucky enough to be descended from some of the 270 plus cultures from around the world. And your connection to this land may stretch back a couple of, couple of months to a couple of hundred years. But whatever your ancestry or your length of connection to this land, if you call this land your home, we are responsible for it. So if we are responsible for this land, it is our duty to ensure that individuals and communities in Australia are respected and valued and are not subjected to prejudice, discrimination or racism. I call on our leaders of the ACTU to sign on for this responsibility. I know that, we know that around 20% of Australians have experienced racial discrimination. Racism has serious consequences for those of us that have experienced it. It can shatter our confidence, our sense of worth. It can undermine our ability to do our job. It can undermine our ability to, to study and be successful. It can affect our mental and physical well-being and our life expectancy. Racism locks us out of social and economic opportunities. Racism can happen at any time. Racism can and is perpetrated by individuals, groups and governments. It can happen to the average person on the street or a national celebrity. It works against our goal of a fair, smart, compassionate and prosperous country. As parents, arts, aunts, uncles and grandparents, we all have dreams and goals for the next generation, as our parents had for us. I want my two and a half year old daughter to never know what racism looks like to never know what racism feels like, to never be the perpetrator or the victim of racism. I don't want her to know what the word racism means. I don't even want her to know that it existed. I want her to live in a country where the constitution can't discriminate against her because of her race. I want her and everyone of the next generation to value and respect the diversity of every person that walks this land. I last witnessed racism firsthand and its profound effects on May 24, 2013. I just happened to be sitting about a dozen rows back from a 13-year-old girl and her family at a football game. While I didn't hear what that young girl yelled, I will never forget the reaction her words elicited from a talented footballer doing his job. I will never forget the reaction of the crowd or the reaction of social and mainstream media. And I will never forget the dignity with which Adam Goods showed in dealing with the young girl, or the responsibility he has accepted in bringing an end to racism. Congress, I call on you to accept the same responsibility, to sign the pledge, as our leaders have done and are doing, to stop racism, to stop it now. Stand with me and stop racism. I commend the motion to you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Michelle. Thanks, Nicole. I uh, also want to acknowledge the 
traditional owners of the land were on this afternoon the Wurundjeri people of the Coolum Nation and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present and our Indigenous brothers and sisters in the room. I've got the great privilege of leading a union that is extraordinarily diverse in its membership. We have members from many nations who speak many languages, but we don't always get it right. And our union movement doesn't always get it right. There's two simple stories I want to tell you today. One uh, was when I was a very young organiser and there was a group of workers in a clothing factory in Melbourne and my job at the time was to go and try and talk to workers and the bosses about why they should talk to each other, which some of you might think is a bit of a weird idea that, that you would have to actually have that conversation, but in many clothing factories um, in the world in, and in Australia, the idea that a boss would ever have a conversation with a worker or an owner would ever have a conversation with a worker is a quite you know, bizarre one. It never happens. Uh, so I was um, talking to the workers about this and they were laughing about this idea that I was going to go and talk to the owner of this factory about having some sort of consultation with them. They said, good luck. Um, and then I met with the owner of the factory and launched into the spiel about how this was an uh, important thing and it was going to be good for the workers and good for them, good for the business, that you know, the workers were the experts, they were highly skilled, they understood. If he spoke more to them, you know, he'd be able to have better work done, get better quality, all the things you might say, um, resolve disputes properly. And he just looked at me shook his head eventually and said, I could get monkeys to do this job. They're no better than monkeys. Never, uh, no, needless to say, I didn't get very far um, and the workers, of course, were right. The other thing I want to tell you about is the number of times that uh, union officials in Australia, comrades, have said to me when I've spoken to them about our, our union and some of the work we've done, um, said to me, well, you can't um, organise Asian workers. An Asian worker, you know, a Vietnamese or a Chinese worker in particular, they won't join a union. Or the other comment that I've heard many times is, well, they'll never go on strike delegates, officials, you know, you'll never get a, a Vietnamese or a Chinese worker to go on strike. Well, I suppose what I want to tell you, and, and many of you know this, of course, is that's just bullshit. Um, uh, some of the most militant workers I've ever had the pleasure to organise and work with and lead and be part of picket lines and disputes and struggles and fights with have been our Vietnamese and Chinese members of our union. And you wouldn't want any other worker standing alongside you. Um, the courage they have shown, and they show every day. So I, I want to end by saying I've got a pretty simple job today. It's, I want to say that many of us know how to do the acknowledgement. We know how to acknowledge the traditional owners. But we've got to do more. We've got to do more for our Indigenous brothers and sisters. What are we saying about the closure of Western Australian Aboriginal communities? What are we doing about Tony Abbott's obscenity of claiming that those communities are a lifestyle choice? Right. What are we doing about organising the great richness and diversity of multicultural Australia. Are our unions reflecting workers in this country? Are our delegates, officials, leaders reflecting the great diversity and richness of our country? And leave you with a simple challenge to say, racism, it stops with me. Thanks. Um, I call on Wayne Wood from the uh, ASU, who is going to move a motion 
uh, to deal with the federal funding cuts to Indigenous programs and the forced closures of communities. Thank you, Wayne. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of land on which we meet and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. I'm Wayne Wood, I'm the branch secretary of the Western Australian branch. Um, look, I speak in favour of the motion. Um, I've got it there, basically, a sign saying stop the forced closures of Aboriginal communities. This is a shameful act by a shameful government. Basically, the effect on the community will be devastating. Uh, we are closing down social and community service groups. Uh, we are withdrawing funding. We are forcing people off the land in their own country. They will become refugees. That is a shameful act. When we look at it, we see people that have lived on the land. They've been there all their lives. It is the only home they have ever known. And they are being forced off their land. There are a number of problems that come from this that will be felt for generations. People will move to regional centres and everybody will know the problems will be there in town. Already we have 250 registered, registered uh, homeless people in Port Hedland. Well, the reality is it's more like a thousand. In Broome, a city or a town of 15,000 people, there is another 4,000 homeless. This will grow. Refugees in their own land. Now, this isn't fair. This is a shameless government. They are a racist government. That's what we're here talking about today. Withdrawing funding from crisis shelters, where our members work, where women go in the middle of the night fleeing the worst of any situation. They are being now sent 200, 300 kilometres on dirt roads at night time, fleeing the worst possible situation to go to a crisis shelter that is full, to be turned away, to live on the beach, basically. I don't know if Tony Abbott knows anything about the bush. I understand he went and lived in a tent for one night. I think he should go to Port Hedland and try and sleep outside in October, right, on the salt flat. Let's kick him out of his house. And that's what we need to do. It is a disgraceful act, pushing Aboriginal people out of medical centres into mainstream. We'll only see the, the average age for death of Aboriginal people go down, younger. That is an appalling thing. These people will be refugees in their own country. That's what he will do, and it is their country. We come and we say when we talk, we pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land. Well, this government's got no respect for the traditional owners of the land. I was in Carafa last week. I went to Port Hedland. I stayed in Roven. That's where I was born. I spoke to a lot of the people there, and they tell me how they feel. They are feeling anxiety. They are depressed. They are facing the worst of situations. It will lead to alcoholism. It will lead to violence. There is already a large number of incarcerated Aboriginal people in prison, right? Poverty forced crimes. And people do what they need to do because they need to survive. But we don't need to do this. Meanwhile, big end of town mining companies are zelebating at the thought that they can just place more mining applications in. Last week I was told 26 mining applications go in for gas. Just happens to be coincidental, I bet. So it's about a land grab and it's forcing Aboriginal people off their homeland, the only home some of them have ever known. And how are the town centres going to handle it? Would it be Geraldton? Carnarvon, Carafa, Robin, Port Hedland, Broome, Derby, Fitzroy Crossing, or Halls Creek, Kununurra, would it be Kalgoorlie or Leonora, Mount Magnet? Those companies will, those towns will be inundated with homeless people. Where are they going to live? It's $2,000 a week 
to rent a house in Carafa, $2,000 a week. I couldn't afford to live there. Delegate, I'm going to have to ask I could not that. afford to live there. So, I understand we've got time restraints. I will move on. This is why I say that this government is despicable. They are cold and heartless. This is a cold and heartless act, and we need to kick them out, basically. So this is why I moved the resolution. Thank, Thank you. you, Wayne. Beautifully said. Uh, comrades, Rita Malia, CFMEU, it's um, my great privilege to support this, rec uh, this resolution and in doing so acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to Aboriginal people and elders past and present. Um, it is really very disappointing and very sad though that in 2015 we still need to pass these sorts of resolutions and it is a disgrace that we, are, we have seen the stolen generation, we've seen stolen wages, we've seen the Northern Territory intervention, and yet we yet see yet another government policy to destroy the lives and the communities of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. So I hope that we can marshal the 1.8 million people that we represent in this country to stand up for, not just in words, but in action, to bring about the true equality that we do need to see and in, in recognising our first people in this nation. And to begin that, I've been asked if any of you could stand up and hold these wonderful placards up and we too can add our voices to this campaign and start to do more to ensure, as I said, uh, to, to really achieve true equality and a photo will be taken. Thank you. And I commend the resolution to the Congress. Thank you, Rita. <laughs> Delegates, I am going to put the motion that is before you. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, that motion is carried. Now,